Good afternoon. I'm Pete Sauer from the University of Illinois, talking to you from beautiful Urbana, Illinois, today on the first Friday of the month of March. For the TCIPG special seminar, we have a, a very guest speaker, uh, Lang Tong, who is from Cornell. He's the Joan and Erwin Jacobs Chair Professor at Cornell in Engineering. And he's also the site director of PSERC, the Power Systems Engineering Research Center. Cornell was the original founding site uh, for PSERC. And Long, uh, Lang Tong is now the site director for Cornell for PSERC. I would like to, he got his PhD, for, his uh, bachelor's from Tsinghua in China, but his PhD from Notre Dame and he's had lots of things. His bio is published. I'm sure you've seen it if you're listening to this. And he has lots of prize papers. What most people don't realize is that his parents are alumni from the University of Illinois. One of uh, his father was an ECE alum from Illinois, probably back in the 50s, I'm going to guess. And his mother, an English major from Illinois. So. Uh, Lang has been back here quite a few times, and we consider him a, a grandson or something or a son of an alum. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome Lang Tong for our seminar today. Lang. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pete. Uh, yeah, this is uh, Illinois is a special place, and I think if my parents didn't work as hard you know, when they were doing their thesis, I could have been born here, and son of Illinois. Um, so. Uh, I will be talking about um, uh, dynamic data attacks on power system real-time operations. Um, this is a joint work with uh, Oliver Cossett, um, who is now uh, assistant professor at Arizona State, uh, my student, Jin Sub Kim, and uh, my colleague, uh, Bob Thomas, who first introduced the problem of attacks on power system to me. So I'm grateful for, for uh, for his input. Um, so the key ideas here, um, hopefully summarized in the title. Uh, so I'm looking at dynamic data attack, by which I mean that attackers is able to assess the situation, adjust its attacking strategies. Um, so the emphasis is going to be on real-time power operations. So I'll be more specific about that. Uh, just as a background, let me um, start by mentioning uh, the 2003 uh, Northeast blackout. Um, so the figure on the right, the figure on the right is the day before August 14, um, 2003. The figure on the on the right is the day after, and um, you can see that. Uh, uh, the light um, in Albany here, and it's significantly dimmed. Uh, Buffalo and Toronto is totally dark. Um, you can't find Ethica New York in any of these two. But, um, so significant things happened um, on that day. Um, uh, it started at 4 p.m. In fact, the first event uh, that's relevant to the blackout started around noon. Uh, of that day. So there's a four hour time period before the actual cascade happened. It lasted four days. Uh, it, uh, 55 million people get affected, uh, lost uh, billions of, of uh, uh, amount of uh, economic uh, impact. Now, um, so there's a long um, uh, study on what really causes this. Uh, what I uh, focused on was the pre-blackout events. So events that eventually led to the cascade failures. Uh, there are a few things that are extremely important. Uh, one of which is the topology errors in the very early uh, time of these, uh, of these uh, blackout sequence. Uh, what happened is that um, their line got tripped in uh, denoise, blooming. Bloomingdale lines, and that, that change of topology was not uh, recorded at the uh, ISO control center. So these discrepancies in 
the topology used to do state estimation and actual topology caused sort of the, the, the online state estimation not functioning. So it was taken offline and we're trying to fix it. So during the time it was trying to fix that discrepancies, additional discrepancy happened. So as a result, from the first event at noon to all the two minutes before the blackout, um, the essentially the power system online state estimation was not in use. Okay. So there's some very significant uh, things that uh, attributed to uh, state estimation, but of course there are many other aspects of this as well. Now, uh, that event was caused purely by accident. Uh, then in the context of cybersecurity, uh, a bigger question is can such backlog be fabricated? Uh, if malicious actors try to penetrate the network and create something similar. Um, I don't have an answer for that, but uh, intuitively, uh, if coordinated attack and with sufficient resource, uh, this should be a significant concern. Okay, so uh, this is um, a, a brief uh, uh, abstract of this. So what we're consider, uh, considering is a power network and, and what is illustrated here uh, on the right and on this bus, that's where a lot of measurements are taken. Uh, in particular, uh, the breaker states, the power flow measurements, possibly PMUs. Uh, those data are propagated or transmitted, uh, communicated to uh, the control center. Uh, what's on the right, um, my right, on your left, is a recent paper that discusses uh, various vulnerabilities uh, of the uh, information network. Uh, my focus is not going to be on uh, the computer systems where it is vulnerable. Uh, nonetheless, um, there are studies that uh, describe the SCADA system or the system that collect data uh, were not designed um, to provide uh, robust authentication and also to take into account the potential of uh, adversary attacks. Okay. Um, so my premise is going to be that uh, adversaries may break into the uh, power system information network. Okay, so I'm going to focus on uh, assuming they are able to do that, uh, what kind of things they can do to affect the real-time operation. Okay, so here is outline. Um, so I'm going to uh, start by uh, talk a little bit about state estimation uh, because state estimation is the fundamental component uh, in power system uh, real-time operation. So that's where uh, data get collected and processed and the information coming out of the state estimation are used to make real-time decisions. Uh, so I will look at uh, some classical ideas in observability, classical uh, uh, notion of when you can estimate a system state and uh, correspondingly when you can make attacks unobservable. Okay. Um, I will then focus on what I call the subspace techniques for attacks. The idea here is attacker, even though um, they may be able to penetrate network, they may not have precise all the system parameters. Uh, so in the era of large data, um, what can they do uh, to develop data-driven techniques that by monitoring the system, try to figure out uh, strategies to attack uh, the power system state estimation. Um, I would then uh, look at uh, what I call the uh, DOS-like attacks. This is not the traditional denial of service attack in the sense that uh, you, the computer servers are not available. So what do we mean by denial of service is that to make uh, control centers operation in, for example, real-time operation not functioning. Okay, by creating, uh, by uh, injecting malicious data, uh, essentially the control center is not able to come up with solutions. Therefore, because this is operating in real time, uh, I don't know what's really happened in, in real world, but uh, if you're, you cannot send real time dispatching on a minute by minute basis, so this will be a significant problem. So I will look at two types of uh, attack, one being the opportunistic attack, meaning that uh, the attacker will wait for the right moment, um, the right moment or, uh, to launch an attack. 
The other one is more insidious in the sense that uh, the attackers uh, try to drift the system operating point to certain boundaries, therefore leading to the solution of uh, uh, dispatch not e existing. Okay, so that's, that's roughly the general idea. Um, so uh, I was told that I should uh, talk a little bit more technical things. Um, so the idea, the theme here um, is to develop graph and uh, algebraic techniques. Okay, uh, to characterize um, an observable attack to be able to construct actual attack vectors. So I'm gonna rely primarily on graph models and, and um, matrix operations. Um, also, we want to develop uh, dynamic attack strategies from a geometric view um, that characterize uh, security constraint economic dispatch. So that's the fundamental building block in real-time operation. Uh, so we, it's very difficult to attack such a system when you write uh, many, many equations with optimization in them. So the insight of this attack comes from a way to characterize the solution geometrically. Okay, so I think once I describe that, uh, probably the strategy to achieve this attack or to construct this attack will become uh, more clear. Okay, so that's, that's my plan. Um, so let me first uh, talk a little bit about what are the uh, real-time operations I will be dealing with. There are many, many things going on in real time, so I'm going to restrict myself to uh, these three blocks. Uh, one of the fundamental blocks is uh, state estimation, because that's where uh, any kind of data uh, manipulation will be processed. Uh, bad data will be thrown out. Um, any uh, malicious uh, attempts may be detected. Okay, so I will talk about uh, if uh, an adversary is to uh, try to uh, change the data um, at uh, the input of state estimation, that effect will be propagated into two additional blocks. One is the real-time dispatch. So that's the signal that control centers send to individual uh, generators. Okay, so uh, that information also comes from the output uh, the, of the state estimation. The second part of this is the computation of real-time locational marginal price as a byproduct um, of this uh, economic dispatch problem. The goal there is a little bit different if you want to affect uh, the real-time uh, uh, price, uh, especially if people want to use this price to to do something like a demand response, so then the goal there will be very, very different. So I will primarily focus on these two blocks. Um, in particular, uh, I will look at, uh, because the state estimation has its own mechanisms to detect uh, bad data, uh, so we want to design data so that they will pass through at least this block, and we will look at the strategies to cause the real-time dispatch not having any solution. So this is optimization without solution, so I guess when you run this thing, you will find it infeasible. What do you want to do? Okay, so in terms of uh, uh, real-time locational price, we have a recent paper on these things. Um, some of the strategies developed here uh, will also be applicable to that. Okay, so there, although they uh, have as sophisticated techniques like the uh, dynamic attack and so forth. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the goal. Uh, so let me just introduce the model. Uh, so I'm gonna abstract a power system in a very crude way as a graph, where vertices contain all the buses, uh, the edges are, uh, edges are the transmission lines, okay? Uh, the system state um, is simply the voltage phasers on each of these bus. And uh, we have measurements. We have two types of measurements. Uh, digital measurements tell you the circuit breaker state. Uh, and analog measurements that uh, measure various things. Uh, all of them are function of the power system state vector x. And of course, this is also a function of the network topology and often it will also have uh, noise involved here. Okay, so this is the model, very crude, but uh, that gives us enough uh, description of the problem that from which we can draw some insights of the strategies of uh, uh, in attack and also countermeasures. 
OK, uh, let me first talk about the state estimation. It's a very simple idea. Uh, this, well, I'm not talking about the sort of the optimal state estimator. This is sort of uh, the a, a, a efficient or simple way to implement them. Uh, at the input of, uh, you have the analog meter measurements, you have the, the breaker state. Uh, together, uh, you come up as an estimate of network topology. Okay. Now, given the uh, network topology, uh, then you estimate the state, so which is voltage phasers on all the buses. Uh, after you have done that, uh, there's an important component called bad data test that essentially uh, tests whatever your estimates against what you have collected to see these two things match against each other. Okay. If, they are, if they are close to each other, uh, it's deemed that your estimates are usable, they will pass to the next stage. Uh, if the discrepancy is too large, uh, then say something wrong. Now, what happens afterwards, there are many different things you can do. Now, one of the uh, actually quite a useful uh, things people do would be a bad data removal. So you look at uh, where, uh, at what meters that discrepancies are significant. You may choose, because there are a lot of redundancies in the system, you can choose to remove those data uh, so that uh, perhaps those data are just outliers. So there are specific ways of, uh, of dealing with bad data. Okay, certainly, if it's a too big uh, a discrepancy, you will be caught. If it's consistent showing up, uh, the further investigation will be, will be warranted. So, okay, so the state estimation is a rather simple one. It's a simple least square. Um, once you have, once you have, I don't know, I should, I should point out here. Once you have, uh, once you have the estimated topology, you are essentially fitting. The things you measured and things what the, you, you, you find the best possible fit by choosing the state vector. Now, bad data test is simply looking at the residue error, and you weight it properly. You set a threshold. If it's greater than threshold, you fail, and less than threshold, you pass. Okay, so this is this is this is all we need. Okay. Now, uh, the most uh, important thing in this aspect is observability. Um, intuitively, that's nothing but. Do I have enough measurements to, to determine what's the state of the system? Uh, so classical concept uh, I'm drawing here is that uh, suppose Z is the measurement, X is the state, power system is nonlinear. You're given the particular measurements, you may have multiple solutions, but we know roughly where the operating point is. So locally, locally around um, uh, the nominal operating point, once you know Z, you roughly can figure out what X is. Okay, so if we uh, linearize things around uh, x0, the operating condition, we can view this roughly locally as a linear equation. If I have z, do I know something about x? Okay, now an uh, 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 unobservable system is something that uh, if you have uh, z, if you, uh, for the observation of z, there could be infinite many solutions. Okay, those are cases that uh, would not only cause numerical errors, it's sort of a cause fundamental problem of which state you should use. Okay, so uh, this is very classical results in, in the 1980s, um, very intuitive. It says that the system is locally observable if this, this matrix shift the matrix H or the Jacobian matrix H has full column rank. Obviously, if it's a full column rank given Z, you can, you can uniquely solve for X. Okay, so this is even only if condition. All right, so what happens if there is a possibility of attack? So we're going to assume um, the so-called man in the middle attack model in which the attack attacker uh, sits in between the measurement data and the data transmitted to the network. So in these things, this guy may be sitting between the bus and the control center. Um, so he has a lot of power. He's able to change the value of some of these uh, meters. And uh, to design strategies, we also have to specify what do we assume he knows. He can assume that he knows everything, that's the most powerful attacker, but often the amount of uh, uh, knowledge he has may be limited. Okay. So, but in any case, so the effect of this change of uh, measurements may create illusions in the, in the con at the control center instead of you have a power system with this topology, some line may not, uh, may not be there. Uh, by changing uh, by changing the data, but of course that's far. It's not that obvious, right? If you remove a line, you have to coordinate your attack in a way that the actual physical measurement of power flow would have to disappear as well. Okay. 
so it's totally non-trivial. Uh, there are uh, different types of strategies. Um, the one I'm going to focus on most is the so-called unobservable attack. Essentially, uh, these are the attacks by changing these measurements, it still passed the bad data test. So you still cannot distinguish whether someone has already, uh, has already manipulated data using purely system function. Of course, there are uh, protection mechanism, authentication schemes that you can, you can deal the, with this kind of problem from a computer security point of view. What I'm saying unobservable, it really means that physical conditions, physical equations are totally satisfied. Okay. Uh, so this is one type of attack. The second type of attack, what do I call this observable attack? So clearly, the control center knows something is wrong. It, it tries to deal with it. Uh, for example, it tries to remove some of the suspicious meter measurements. Um, here, the goal of attacker is to create illusions that certain good meters get removed. So you try to mislead the control center to remove, to think certain data are not reliable, uh, but in fact, they are actually perfectly good data. You know that if you remove enough of these good data, things will become unobservable. OK, so those are two different strategies. And, and uh, we'll primarily talk about the first one. OK, um, so let me first give a more precise definition of what I mean by unobservable attack. So here is a attack model. Here is your measurement. Here is the system uh, equation that governs the relationship between the power system state and its observation. And here, A is the attack vector injected by the adversary. Now, of course, you don't have access to all the meters. Uh, on the right, what we're describing here, all the red things are assumed are meters that adversary would have access to. So this set A would uh, put restrictions on uh, what meters you can have access to. OK, so we call an attack A being uh, this thing is not very easy to use. Attack A being unobservable if this uh, measurement Z bar is entirely consistent with some state that is totally different from what it should be. Okay. So from this uh, uh, equation point of view, there is no difference between uh, the actual system state XT and uh, the faked system uh, state XT bar. Okay. So we call this attack unobservable. OK, now uh, perhaps the first uh, simple uh, construction of, of an observable attack is something like this. If we take the, it's done by Leoning and Ryder in 2009, the paper that generated a lot of citations, a lot of interest. Uh, so it's to look at a linearized model. I couldn't figure out where, OK, here. <laughs> a linearized model, z equal to hx. So this is the attack vector. And you say that, suppose I can construct this vector A. Suppose I can construct this vector A. I think I still use this. This vector A uh, in the column space of matrix H. And if you can just combine, uh, you pull H out, you have X bar. Okay. So if you can choose this attack vector in the column space of system operating subspace, then you can perturb the system state. OK, very, very simple idea. Um, OK, so, uh, but that uh, doesn't give us ways to say something about what is the condition that such kind of attack is possible. Um, this is, a, 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 this is a, a, a result that actually uh, make a connection between attack and the system observability. Uh, it says the following, that the attack is uh, unobservable if and only if so here is the system matrix H, and some of the meters correspond to adversaries. So if I remove these uh, adversary meters, what's left is singular. OK. The notion of unobservable system is, has something to do with the singularity of matrix here. The things, how it's related to attack is that if you remove those meters that are attacked by the adversary, what's left needs to be singular. So this is a necessary and sufficient condition. OK. And um, this is actually quite natural. The way you construct, the way you construct an attack vector is to choose uh, a vector that is in the null space of this H tilde. So because you choose that, when you multiply this matrix with, with delta x, all these, all these entries are zero. 
So they are zero at all those entries you don't have any access to, and what's left is and are entries you have access to. So they perfectly fit into the condition. Okay. So in that case, you will you will be able to perturb the system uh, almost uh, to arbitrary uh, degree. Okay. So that's that's the algebraic condition um, that uh, that uh, we will we will try to. Uh, take advantage of. Now, uh, even though this gives you explicit construction uh, to be able to construct the, the attack, you have to know the entire matrix, which means that you should know the topology of the network, you should know the parameters of the network, you should know all kinds of things. Um, so the question is, can we uh, do this with uh, measurements only? So can we learn the operational subspace? Uh, not go through learning the topology, uh, collect data, can we, can we get something that effectively allows us to construct attack? Um, okay, so this is a very old idea in, in signal processing, radar, and many different applications. Um, so let's consider a linear model, like uh, we're DC model, so where Z of T um, is, is the measurement, H is the matrix, X of T would have been the, the system state. Uh, we're going to assume that the original system is observable. So that's a reasonable assumption. H have full rank. Um, if I just compute the sample covariance of this matrix, uh, take Z and times Z transpose, um, if you compute uh, the column space of Rz hat from the sample covariance matrix, uh, one can show that if you have seen if the, uh, the sample covariance matrix of the system state is non-singular, then uh, this, this subspace from the sample covariance matrix is the same as the uh, actual the system parameter matrix H. Okay. So this is something that you can easily get from data, uh, while matrix H is something that's private and related to the actual topology. Okay, so we're going to assume that uh, uh, you're able to monitor the data and compute the sample covariance and do a single variety of decomposition and get this U matrix. Okay, so now from this U matrix, you can then construct attack. In fact, it's actually almost trivial. Uh, what you will do is almost exactly the same. You will choose uh, this U matrix. So this is, this is, these are the meters that you have control with. And you will choose a vector delta x that's in the null space of what's left, this u bar. And uh, the same algebra works, so that's all you need. In fact, all you need is not the entire matrix, all you need is the uh, subspace that characterizes the operating conditions. Okay, so, um, so that's, that's, that's a simple idea. Now, uh, that doesn't tell you uh, where, for example, if you're an attacker, you may be wondering where should I put the meters, which meters I should attack. So I'm going to try to address that problem, but let me first uh, mention uh, an interesting um, uh, a placement problem. Uh, so here, uh, KCL stands for Kirchhoff Law. Um, so we look at a two different meter placement. Uh, one is the meter placed at the injection, the other one meter placed in this. Now, Because of the Kirchhoff Law, these two things give you identical information. Because if you know any of the three, you should be able to determine the fourth one. Okay. So these two placements give you exactly the same information. Okay. For example, here is a network uh, that uh, you have meters here. And the information you collect from this network would be identical with the information collected in this network. Because the only thing different between these two is the meter here on the injection. Here the meter is on the bus. Uh, uh, on, the, on, on the transmission line that uh, they attach to the same bus. Okay. So this is uh, uh, the basis of uh, this interesting work of uh, uh, Comhos, Clemens, and Davis in, in 1980. So we will say that uh, 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 we're going to uh, consider meter assignments where uh, all the branch meters are fixed. Now you are allowed to move the injection meters around either stay where it is or move to a line that is attached to the same bus. Okay. Information-wise, they give you exactly the same information to determine whether the system is observable or not. Um, so with this, 
uh, one can come up with conditions when an observable attack exists from a graphical standpoint. Uh, here it says that uh, uh, attack is unobservable if and only if if you remove the adversary meters, the whole network breaks into parts. So in other words, once you remove the adversary meters, the network becomes, it creates a cut. Creates a cut. Okay. Here is an example. Um, here is a, a, a set of meters in the network. Suppose I remove everything related to, so I create a cut. Here I have three edges. And I remove all the meters. So if I attack all the meters associated with uh, these transmission lines, including the one on the bus that's that's attached to this, okay, then the network breaks into two parts, and such attack cannot be detected. Everything will be consistent. So this uh, changed the problem from an algebraic condition that check rank to a, a, a graph problem of where you attack to create cuts. And it is the cuts that really create this unobservable attack. Okay, so here I, after I remove all the red ones, clearly on this cut there is no meter on them. Okay, so there's no meter. So two things cannot be connect with each other. All right. So uh, then you uh, you may think about okay. So what is the minimum meters I have to attack the system? Okay. So here. Um, uh, there's a notion of security index that's introduced uh, that basically says that what is the smallest, smallest set of adversary meters to make the system uh, unobservable. Where do you find it? Given the graph, how do you find them? Uh, this problem actually, uh, if you solve it as a rank problem, is an NP hard problem. But uh, from, uh, from this graph viewpoint, uh, it becomes a problem uh, in, a sub, uh, in the minimization of submodular function, which does have the polynomial solution. Okay, so let me explain what it is. Uh, so essentially, a so e is the set of all edges. A is a subset of all edges. You consider all the possible edges or the transmission lines in the system, and you will choose uh, that subset to make this function as small as possible where g of a is all the flow meters on the set of edges you are looking at. Okay, so you choose a set of edges, you count how many meters on them. h of a is after you remove these edges, how many disconnected components left in the system. Okay, so this optimization can be done in polynomial time. For example, if I choose these three edges as my choice, so you can count how many meters attached to this, which is nine. The network, after you remove this, it break into two. So this quantity will be nine minus two plus two is equal to nine. Okay. Uh, but there are many choices you have. For example, for this choice, uh, uh, so there are three meters attached to this particular uh, edge. And uh, uh, so it breaks the system into two. So this thing will give you three. This turned out to be uh, the, the one that requires the least amount of uh, penetration of uh, adversary meters. Okay, anyway, uh, so um, that also suggests ways that uh, if you try to protect the system by implementing, for example, authentication schemes. Uh, the problem with uh, looking at pure physical quantities, you, when you get a piece of data, you don't know whether someone has tempered it or not. So suppose you have authentication scheme that is implemented non, not on all the meters, but subset of meters, uh, then um, on those meters you know people uh, perhaps less likely that an adversary would have tempered that data. So that uh, previous result essentially suggests that what you should do is to take, to find a spanning tree of the network and authenticate all the meters relevant to that spanning tree. Okay, so I don't want to say too much about that. So here's spanning tree. Essentially, these are the meters that you need to implement slightly more uh, security measure on them. Okay, so this is uh, uh, what I talked about so far uh, assumes that you actually know everything. So you have the entire measurements. Um, but uh, often adversary can only have access to a subset of meters. 
Okay, you don't know the whole state. Okay, so what can you do if you have only access to a subset of meter? For example, this is 18, this is 118 bus. Suppose you only have a few meters compromised here in this subset. Uh, can you launch an attack that is unobservable? Okay, so this notion of uh, cuts actually uh, plays important role to be able to quantify uh, what is the condition for that. Uh, it goes like this. So the adversary meters have two parts. Uh, those meters you may only observe. The data from those meters you may only observe. And there's a subset of meters that not only can observe the value on those meters, but you can change them. Okay. So I'm going to denote that uh, set of meters that the adversary can change value as a set of attack meters, set of meters that you can only observe as O as observing meters. Okay, so here's a simple condition. You can check whether the adversary, it is possible for them to launch an attack. Okay, so first of all, uh, this, this set of meters must be able to, uh, there must exist uh, uh, an unobservable attack. Okay, otherwise there is no notion of that. Second, you take the whole network, you throw out all those transmission lines and buses that has nothing to do with adversary meters. So this is what's left. So in the previous, I threw out all everything. I only look at this set of uh, subset of buses and buses and, uh, and, uh, and transmission lines. The condition is that the set of attack meter in this subsystem form a critical set. By that, we mean that if you remove this set of meters, this subsystem becomes unobservable. If you remove one less, the system is still observable. Okay, very simple way to check, but nonetheless, so this is the condition. This is not a necessary sufficient condition, however, uh, it is a sufficient condition. Okay. Um, okay, so this is a different type of attack that we have looked at, um, is what we call the framing. Uh, so this is something that the uh, adversary would inject uh, malicious data to make some good meters look bad. Okay, so you create bigger residue errors at those meters that are that are perfectly good, hoping that the control center would, in the process of bad data removal, would remove that. Okay, uh, the fact that this this strategy actually, uh, what you would do is, if these are the set of meters you have control, uh, you will try to make some of the meters on the cut that you don't have control to have excessive residue error. Okay, so in fact, one can show that whatever you can do before, now you only need half of the uh, meters to accomplish that. So this is the, called the factor of two theorem, which is, says that uh, if an unobservable attack with adversary meter S exists, then this kind of da data framing strategy would uh, you would allow you to launch the same attack with half number of adversary meters? Okay, you can formulate this problem uh, as follows, and and you're going to design attack vector A so that the residue errors on those meters you try to frame as large as possible. So this is a quadratic uh, cons quadratic uh, programming with quadratic constraints. In fact, the solution of this is uh, a simple eigenvalue problem. Okay. Um, so let me now talk about uh, uh, strategies of attacking economic dispatch. So all I have been talking about so far are how do we change data, uh, we alter the measurement data so that the state can be perturbed. Okay. So now I'm going to focus on uh, the effect of this perturbation of system estimation state on the real-time dispatch. Okay, so real-time dispatch, this is economic dispatch, is a solution of an optimization. Okay, so we need first to abstract this optimization to something that we can gain some insights into how to launch an attack. So uh, let me just first write down this economic dispatch problem and uh, by first pointing out the two things that are most important that change with time. Okay, the first is estimated real-time generation. So this is a function of state estimates. Once you know the states, you can compute how much each generator is generating at time t. Second, there's a load forecast. So what's the demand in next step? Okay, so economic dispatch solve, uh, the real-time economic dispatch solve the following problem. Given what the system is generating now, 
given what is needed in the next interval, what is the next dispatch thing? Okay, so that is solved by, uh, this is a simplified version. That, let me, if I take this, the linear cost. So this is the uh, minimizing the generation cost. Uh, this equation is the power balance. Essentially, the sum of all generated things will be sum of all the uh, desired uh, uh, demand. Okay, so this is a power balance. Uh, this equation is set of generation capacities. So each generator can only be uh, generating value greater than GI minimum, less than GI maximum. And the third one is a power flow uh, limit, thermal limits. So on each transmission line, uh, the power flow on this line has to be less than certain value. Okay. So the last one is the ramping constraints. You cannot assume that the generator will change arbitrarily. So we're going to limit generation uh, in the next step different from the current step by uh, less than this value or greater than that value. Okay. This is the uh, uh, simplified version of real-time dispatch optimization. But what's most important in this optimization are these red quantities. These red quantities are changing with time. Okay, that's where data collected from the field get into this real-time dispatch problem. Okay, everything else, it doesn't change with time. Okay, it uh, looks uh, rather complicated how to see this. So what's important is to look at uh, some kind of a, a geometry that describes this. Uh, the way to see this, we're going to look at uh, a simple two uh, generator problem. You have a G1 here, G2 there, and this bigger box, this bigger box is essentially what's allowed the generation limit. Okay, so each generator would just stay within this interval. Uh, then there's this line, 45 degree line, that indicating the power balance. So this is the sum of all demand in the next interval. G1 plus G2 would have to be equal to that. Okay, so your solution should be on these on these 45 degree line. Okay, now this triangle represents a thermal limit. Each one of these represents uh, the equality condition of uh, of a thermal limit. So on one side of the, one side of that uh, would be the thermal limits get satisfied. Okay. So the intersection of all these things, this red little red segment, is the feasible solution, feasible set of solutions. And this little black dot is where you are. Okay. When you run this optimization, this is the current step. The next dispatch signal will be one of these things. Will be on this red line. And if you solve a linear program, you know it's going to wind up with some of the edges, some of the extreme points. Okay. So this is all I need to know. Okay. So that's the geometry of uh, of uh, uh, of a solution. Uh, suppose that uh, at the, this moment, so this is where you are, and this, uh, this, this segment is the feasible solution, and the next step, the dispatch signal sent to everyone would be going there. Okay. So the operating condition will change from this in time instance to that. Okay, so now if you have a sequence of sequence of uh, operating points, so this is this is the demand at time t plus one. So you are here, the dispatch signal will be there. If the next demand is this line that gives you this feasible set, uh, the next step will be there. So as time go by, the uh, the demand function demand level changes uh, that creates a trajectory of the dispatch signal points. Okay. So this is the normal situation. Okay. Uh, at the, if you look at the long sequence of time, so these are like time uh, snapshots at a different time. Okay. So let me go back to attack. Okay. So again, uh, uh, this is the model we have. So here is where the system state. Here is the measurement. Oh, I'm sorry. Here is where the system is. This is measurement. Uh, the adversary changed the measurement. Uh, the control center is not able to detect it. And then this is the, what control center sees the actual system state. And I, I should also stress that uh, uh, the amount of change on the meters should be limited uh, for two reasons. One is a dramatic change in this measurement value would immediately get detected. Second, we're designing uh, attacks based on a linear model. And that linear model is only accurate when 
the small step change works. So we usually would limit how much step you can move. Nonetheless, if you, if you change the measurements, that the system estimates of the state would change as well. Okay, so here is the reason that we're gonna, we're gonna limit, we're gonna limit that amount of change that uh, each time, each step you can make. Okay, so that's the, that's the basic attack model. Um, so I'm gonna look at two um, attacks. So I'll just show you roughly what's the inside here. The first one is opportunistic attack. So as an adversary, uh, you will wait until the system operating conditions that reach uh, somewhere close to the boundary points, and then you inject data so that the, these, uh, these uh, feasible region disappears. Okay. For example, uh, this is a case. This is this is the uh, power balance. Let's say currently you are here and uh, you have intersection there. Suppose you create an illusion that to the control center, uh, your current state that gives you this point. Clearly, uh, with the with the ramping limit, with the ramping limit, uh, the control center would uh, have no solution to solve this problem. Okay. This applies to this applies to power balance. This applies to all the um, the thermal limits as well. And you can actually uh, set up an optimal optimization problem that to direct what is the direction of moving this uh, for for the attack. So this actually is also a simple um, uh, optimization one can do. Okay, but uh, this you have to wait. You have to wait until the right moment. Okay. Um, okay. So a slightly more interesting one is dynamic attack. Uh, here, instead of waiting for the opportunity to arrive, you try to drift the system. You try to move the system to a particular direction. Okay. So let me first start with this, this, this figure. Uh, again, so here is where you are. Uh, these box represent ramping constraints. So this is the, the power balance, this red segment is the feasible set of solutions. Okay. Suppose now you move, you let the control center believe that instead of at the black dot, it is at the red dot. Then uh, at the control center, you would have solved this problem based on the red box. And the solution, instead of it's supposed to be here, it moves to here. It is somewhat closer to this particular boundary. Okay, so now the game is uh, you moved one step. Okay, so can you do this in a, in, a, in a consistent way so that we will move to the boundary? For example, if you move to somewhere here, then whatever the strategy you develop in the opportunistic attack would apply. So if you do one more step, this becomes uh, not feasible anymore. Okay, so. Uh, this is a dynamic problem that uh, you, you can perhaps set up a dynamic optimization. Well, now we don't know how to do that. We will just take a greedy technique. So at any particular time, you choose a particular direction that is looks most promising. You drive toward that direction. Okay. Of course, you can do this adaptively every time you look for the best, but you can also do it in a persistent way. Just go one direction. Okay. So you can also solve, if you, once you have decided which direction to go, you can solve a optimization problem where you optimize the attack um, vector subject to, subject to how much uh, change you are allowed to use. The goal here is to make this segment, the blue segment, um, move as much as possible toward, toward a particular boundary point. Okay, so that's that's essentially is the the inside of these these greedy uh, strategy that uh, that we have done. All right, so let me just uh, show a little bit about uh, this simulation. This artificial, uh, but anyway, so this just illustrate um, how much uh, how much uh, what is uh, how long does it take? Like the type of metric you need to measure is how long does it take for you to actually achieve. Uh, Make the control center uh, believe there is no feasible solution. Okay, so this is the load change, and uh, so these red meters are meters that are attacked by uh, the adversary. Uh, clearly, in this case, you can create two cuts out of this. You already know roughly how many dimensions you can have, 
how many dimensions you can have in this type of directions you can search. In this case, it's a two-dimensional case. OK, uh, Okay. so you implement this, you, you run simulations. Uh, my student runs simulations. Um, so these are, uh, within 30 time period, how many of them are successful. So the x-axis is, if you're allowed to perturb 5% only, most of them not successful. 7%, there are few of them successful. 9% perturbation, you can see uh, start to increase. So the bigger one is the dynamic attack. The red one is opportunistic attack. So essentially, it's one shot case. Uh, here, if you uh, increase the horizon that you're willing to wait, um, obviously, everything grows. Okay? Um, one can look at a distribution. One can look at uh, uh, cumulative function. Here is the attack durations. Um, like you know, 10 intervals, 20 intervals, 100 interval. Uh, these are different level of perturbation that you are allowed to do. This is 5%, 7%, and uh, 9%, 11%, and 13%. Okay, I don't know how much you can read out of this. Anyway, this makes sense. And to increase the uh, attack power, you will achieve infeasibility much faster than use small amount of uh, uh, perturbation. Okay, so let me just conclude um, that, uh, uh, so I'm not really dealing with uh, mechanisms to penetrate the information network. I'm going to assume that is uh, uh, no perfect security exists, so it is possible someone get into the network. Uh, but the, the emphasis here is that a sample security for this kind of a separate physical system, um, you need to deal with both the physical aspects of the problem, that is just, you know, the, the equations, uh, as well as the information network aspect of the security problem. Um, and uh, there are actually many modes of attack. Uh, I only look at a few. You can attack the uh, state estimation. You can attack topology of the system, uh, which we did a little bit on that. Uh, so here we are focusing on attack real-time dispatch. You can attack the real-time uh, MP calculation because that is just a dual problem out of this real-time dispatch. Um, you can also look at the uh, real-time contingency analysis. Uh, so if you take the uh, state estimate, use that in part of your contingency analysis, you can make the analysis think there is no contingency happens while there is something there, or creating uh, force contingencies that uh, then you have to do something about. Okay, um, and uh, uh, the things I find the most interesting is in fact a data-driven approach, where you you have a, a dual purpose of uh, meters that one collect information that you learned operating conditions, the other one uh, once you gain enough information, uh, you launch the attack. So that's sort of a capture that uh, that's this, this line of research. Uh, I'll point out a few papers so we looked at um, in terms of uh, uh, what are the observable attack, the characterized the graph conditions in, in, in the first paper, and we look at the attack on topologies and, and, uh, and a bunch of related things. So that's all. Very nice talk, Lang. Uh, really nice uh, results. I have just a question to make sure that I understood the connection between the first part and the second part. So in the second part, all you are relying on is the, the corruption of the injection meters, where, whether you know, they are essentially measuring injected power, or just, you know, just, just load. And uh, I guess the connection with the first part is that uh, you want to corrupt uh, those to make sure that they are unobservable. That's, that's uh, how you are connecting things? Uh, uh, not really. Uh, so the first part deal with uh, change the actual system, estimated system state. Correct. Now, uh, you want to change it in a way that the bad data detection cannot detect it. Right. So that's the unobservable part. Yes. The second part deals with using the system, estimated system state to compute each one, how many you generate. So this is not just the generator meters. Actually, the way they do is you use uh, state estimation to compute what everybody is, everybody is generating. 
So this could be on, uh, you use other meters as well, not just the meters on your own generator. So, so what you are saying is that the, the, you use the solution of the state estimation problem uh, to compute the injections that then go into the real-time economic Correct. dispatch. Correct. I see. In okay. fact, you use that uh, as a way to check if someone is following the instruction or not. Right, right, right. So that, that's the connection. Really. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Yes. Very nice. I got a few questions. The yeah. first one is uh, for the first part, uh, you can locate the adversary meters, but what about those uh, uh, detailed values that you want to inject on those meters? Do you want to decide that, or just uh, it, it is just okay? Just uh, uh, make sure that the arrow is out of this residue. Uh, okay, um, I'm, I'm not sure I actually followed the question. The the point is that the, from what perspective you're looking at? It? Are you looking at it as a, from perspective of, of an attacker, or you are looking at the perspective from a system operator that tried to? Uh, I think it's from the attacker because he, he, okay. from the attacker you can locate those meters. You know the meters. So there are two things. One is you want to select a set of meters that you want to attack most efficiently. Yeah. Second is once you have selected, what are the values you use to yeah, attack? Yeah, that's right. How you so, decide those values. Yeah, the, so the values you use to attack comes from, you can come from the subspace of the, what you have learned. Mm, okay. So there are explicit constructions that to use the vectors that in the null space of, of this, this subspace. So that actually has a specific constructions of how to, how, what are the values to use. Because uh, also following this question, because also you want to the, the, the system administrator to exactly remove those adversary meters. Yes. So I was wondering, so you have to guarantee that all the other meters has no arrows. In this way, it seems that you have to also modify the measurement from the other meters and guarantee that there's no arrows. So like you first have to removing the arrows from the other meters, and uh, then try to removing those arrows, sending those measurements to the administrator, uh, uh -huh. sending to the control center, and sending the, also sending the compromised measurement for the adversary meters. So I guess this, I don't know whether this is also correct in my thinking or not. Um, I, I don't uh, For example, there are two set of, mind, Okay, there are two <laughs> set of arrows, two yeah. set of meters. One is adversary meters, uh -huh. the other one is, uh, uh, the other meters. Normal meters. Normal yeah. meters. Adversary meters, you want to the control center to think this meters has arrows. So they, can, they will remove it. So in front of the attacker's point of view, in order to make this attack successful, you have to make sure the adversary meters have the arrows. And at the same time, you have to make sure the normal meters don't have the arrows. Oh. Oh, okay. So you are talking about those framing attack? Is that what you are thinking? So there are two strategies. One is you, you inject errors so that the control center cannot see. It's un, these are what's called unobservable attack. So yeah. control center cannot see. Okay. Yeah. So that's one strategy. Second strategy is, is you want control center says something is wrong. And you go through the, uh, your, your data and identify set of meters you think is wrong. Okay. So th for that strategy, I want to make sure that the normal meters exhibit larger residual error. So you design your, you have a few, you have a control of few meters, you inject data into those meters such that the residue error on some good meters become large. So that's the strategy, so that those meters get framed and get thrown out. Once those meters get thrown out, then effectively a reduced number of good meters in the system. So that was the goal. Mm -hmm. The so. other thing is about that uh, attack on the economy dispatch. I was just wondering whether in your experiment you measure the, uh, the, the amount of, or quantify the loss of the uh, cost that can, can be achieved from your tax. Ah, uh, no. So our goal here is not to reduce the cost. Our goal is to make the problem doesn't have solution. Okay. So in a way, it's harder to do because harder to compare with that, right? So the goal is the control center run this program, then no solution. Okay. Okay. So, so that's the measure of success. The last one is probably a little bit beyond your presentation. It's just because you, when you talking about the false data injection, um, you always say that they can, the attacker can achieve through the many the middle manner. So, but from the cybersecurity point of view, if you have to, if you give the attacker the privilege to uh, modify the data, I assume that they have the privilege to modify the control command that directly sending to the substation. So in this way, I just 
hope to see your comment whether this is more easier to, to perform attacks than just uh, focus on the inject the false data and solving those equations. Uh, yeah, I think uh, clearly what we do is limited. Um, so, yeah, I see the f signal that is. Okay, let's uh, thank uh, Lang again very much. Thank you.